Ave Maria. Welcome to the History Programme, a monthly series of programmes produced by the Franciscans of the Immaculate for Gate of Heaven Radio. In this series, we will be looking at events in history, famous people in history, including saints and blesseds, foundations of religious orders, and much more. In short, anything in history that has a Catholic perspective. Our objective will be to tell you the facts as recorded by history. We will not be entering into polemics nor aiming to generate any controversy. If we venture an opinion, we will say so. You are free to agree or disagree. This month's programme is entitled Life in an Ancient Irish Monastery. Our programme tonight takes us to Ireland, back to the beginnings of Christianity in that country. St. Patrick, the Apostle of Ireland, arrived in Ireland as Bishop in the year 432 AD. He arrived in a land ruled by Druidism, a type of pagan worship. Over the next 30 years or so, until his death, Patrick succeeded in converting the whole of the country, substituting Christianity for Druidism. As the eminent French historian Henry Daniel Ropes put it, the cross was planted in a land where Roman rule had not first paved the way for it. By the time Patrick died, Ireland was already known as the land of saints and scholars. Monsieur Daniel Rops has termed this whole series of events as the Irish miracle. One of the most striking features that arose in Ireland from the time of St. Patrick was monasticism, and a uniquely Irish type of monasticism at that. The names of some of these monasteries are well known, along with the saints associated with them. For example, Glendalough and St. Kevin, Clomacnoise and St. Ciaran, Clonard and St. Finian, Anger and St. Comgall, Arran and St. Ende. Just as well known are some of the many Irish saints who left Ireland and went abroad, founding monasteries in far off countries. For example, St. Aidan, who founded a monastery at Lindisfarne in the northeast of England. St. Colm Kill, who went to Iona in Scotland to found a monastery there, and is known as the Apostle of Scotland. And St. Colm Banus, who founded monasteries in Luxeol and Bobbio in present day France and Italy, respectively. However, in tonight's programme, we will stay in Ireland and have a look inside an ancient Irish monastery. That is, the Irish monastery as it existed before the 12th century, after which time the Irish monasteries lost their own monastic rules and were obliged to come under another rule, such as the rule of St. Benedict. So let us now examine the everyday life of the monk in an ancient Irish monastery. Firstly, let us consider how the Irish environment was conducive to the eremitical life lived by these early Irish monks. As the Irish Jesuit, Father Martin P. Harney, puts it so eloquently in his booklet, Life in an Ancient Irish Monastery, remote and difficult spots attracted these holy recluses, for they found in the loneliness and the barrenness sure opportunities for the severe austerities by which they would scour their lives of worldly dross. Deep vision seers, these ardent lovers of God, recognised in the lofty towering mountains, in the silent forest depths, in tumbling surges of the seas, the material manifestation of his omnipotent majesty. 
Thus, whether it was the rocky island of Skellig Michael, or in the depths of the forest of Clomac Noise, or in the remoteness of the mountain valley of Glendalough, these Irish monks found their ideal spot for contemplation. Saint Bede the Venerable, the great historian and doctor of the church, writes of the wholesomeness and the fineness of the air in Ireland. Interestingly, he also tells us that there is no noisome creeping beast to be seen there in Ireland, no serpents that can live there. For many times, serpents which had been brought hither out of Brittany, that is the island of Britain, the ship drawing near unto the land, as soon as they are touched with the smell of the air, they die out of hand. St. Bede wrote this about three centuries after the arrival of St. Patrick, who was credited with driving out the snakes from the country. So what did these ancient Irish monasteries actually look like? The monastery itself was surrounded by a rampart, or wall, of approximately 16 to 20 feet in height. The wall was embedded with earth and sods, and was crowned by a palisade, or a hedge. The area enclosed by the wall was oblong, or circular, or elliptical in shape. The length of this wall could vary from a few hundred feet to a third of a mile. The wall had four wooden gates. To reach, each ga to reach each gate, a person had to cross a protecting ditch, the width of a moderate road. Inside the rampart, at a distance of approximately seven feet, there was a second wall, and sometimes even a third wall. These walls existed not to keep the monks in, but to keep the world out. Now, let us take a look inside these walls, to the centre of the monastic settlement. What do we find there? Father Harney describes the scene for us. A little street stretched down the centre of the settlement. It was lined with the workshops of smiths and carpenters, cattle sheds, granaries, the refectory, guest houses and the library. At the end of the street stood the chief church, and behind this were grouped the cells and dormitories of the community. All the buildings were small, simple, and devoid of decoration, except a church in which austerity was made to yield a bit to artistic devotion. The material of construction was determined by the locality, only where stone abounded, as in the west, were the structures built of stone. Elsewhere, wood or wattles and clay were used. Smooth planks, closely and strongly fitted together, were employed in the walls of the church and the larger buildings. The roofs of the minor structures were formed of straw or reeds. If the church were of stone, its roof would be of stones laid in dry masonry, as at St. Kevin's Church at Glendalough. The cells of the monks were detached huts of wattles and clay, sometimes round in shape. Where stone abounded, one might find curious beehive-shaped huts called clockons. The clockon was oval in shape, about 19 feet by seven and a half with one entrance. Although the clock on Nakariga in the Aran Islands had two doors, east and west, and a window in the south side. The construction of the stone cell merits consideration. They were built without mortar of any kind. The successive layers of flat stones were made to overlap until the fin final opening on the top was closed with one or two flat slabs. 
The stones of each layer were given an outward and a downward slope to prevent the rain from coming in. Occasionally, cluckons were covered with sods to keep them warm in the wintry winds that blew off the ocean. The cells, whether of wattles or stone, varied in size. Some accommodated two or three monks, others four to seven. In addition to the chief church, usually there would be in the enclosure one or two small oratories. These would be places of special devotion. Possibly one might have served as the abbot's private chapel. Now let's take a look at the monastery shops. In one monastery shop, artificers moulded chalices, bells, croziers and crosses. In another shop, called the Scriptorium, monastic scribes copied manuscripts and illuminated psalters and missals. Adjacent to the Scriptorium stood the monastic library. Some shops were located outside the monastery rampart, for example the shops and the adjoining cottages of the workers and the dependents of the monastery. The monk's habit consisted of a long, coarse woolen garment, topped with a hood and reaching to the feet. During cold weather, a heavy cloak made of the same material could be worn. The colour of both the habit and the cloak was white. Most of the monks wore sandals. Some, such as St Columbanus, even wore gloves. When travelling on a missionary journey, a monk carried a staff with him. This was simply a long, smooth stick, turned at the top like a shepherd's crook. The staffs of saintly founders were deeply reverenced. The staff of St. Chiron was enshrined in decorated metal and is on display in the National Museum in Dublin. St. Patrick's staff was considered to be something so holy as to be called the Bacchal Isa, or in the English language, the Staff of Jesus. So how were, how were the monasteries governed? The monastery was ruled by an abbot, who might also be a bishop if the monastery were the centre of a diocese. In the beginning, abbots were probably not actually elected, but rather chosen by their predecessor, in later times, abbots were elected by the monks themselves. The abbot might also have a secretary to assist him. The monastic official next in rank after the abbot was the seknab, or the vice abbot, who was responsible for administering the temporalities of the abbey. After him came the cellarer, who was in charge of the kitchen and the cellar. And after him came the guest master, who provided hospitality to the traveller, the pilgrim and the poor. The signores were elder monks chosen for their virtue and who were entrusted with minor offices of authority, such as directing the younger mon monks. Now let's take a look at the formation of the, of the, the, the monks. The postulants and the novices of the monastery were of two classes. There were the youths who entered the monastery at an early age and there were the conversi, that is, those who in mature life had abandoned the world, perhaps after a life of sin. The younger aspirants, however, were the more numerous. Once accepted by the abbot, the aspirant would be given the habit and his head shaved in the form of a tonsure. The tonsure would have been something of a penance for the mature aspirants, given that long hair, hair was very much in vogue then and a shaved head was a sign of slavery. Regarding the formation of the aspirant, Father Harney writes, 
His spiritual formation was not in the hands of a common novice master. There does not seem to have been such an official, official in early Irish monasticism. Rather, he was expected to learn the ways of religious life from observing and imitating the professed monks. To one of the signores was appointed a task of imparting to him the needful instruction and of seeing that he was in earnest in the practice of virtue. How long the period of probation lasted cannot be definitely stated. It varied according to the judgment of the abbot as to whether the aspirant had manifested sufficient virtue in enduring the trials and in making the progress requisite for admission to the one vow of stability. That is, to live as a monk under obedience for the remainder of his days. It was the only vow taken. By it, the novice bound himself to a life of mortification and self-denial, to the practice of the virtues, charity, humility, prayerfulness and zeal, and above all, to the three fundamental elements of religious life, poverty, chastity and obedience. Besides the monks, three other groups lived in the monastic settlement, namely the workmen. The workmen assisted the monks in the shops and in the fields, and they dwelt in little huts outside the enclosure. Secondly, there were the hermits, and these led an eremitical life in solitary cells within the cashel, or the walled enclosure or in remote spots in the neighbouring valley or forest. And lastly, there were the penitents. These were those who were living a life of penance in expiation of past sins. So let's take a look at the prayer life of the monks. The divine office was held in high esteem. The various offices were chanted each day in the chapel, beginning with the morning office before dawn. Not surprisingly, Holy Mass was held in high esteem by the monks, so much so that preparations for it began the day before. Mass was celebrated daily during Lent, but otherwise only on Sundays, feast days, or under the death of a friend. It lasted about two hours. The sacrament of penance was important in the, in the life of the monastery. Listeners should remember that in those days, the penances given out were very great indeed, and confession was in public as well. It was the Irish monks who began the practice of private individual confession, and also of lessening the penances, practices eventually adopted by the Universal Church. Father Harney writes that, of the many devotional practices in use, the veneration of the saints was greatly cherished by the Gaelic monastic brethren. Ancient rules and chronicles show that St. Patrick, St. Comgal, St. Martin, St. Peter and St. Paul, and above all, our Blessed Mother, were especially honoured. Manual labour was important in the daily life of the monk and was required under the rule. It was said that the monk is fed and clothed by the labours of his hands. Work included farming the land, tending the cattle and sheep, cooking in the bakery and the kitchen, craft work in the shops, in addition to the normal household chores. The only monks exempt from work were the sick. Manual labour was not the only kind of labour engaged in by the monks. There was also what we might term intellectual labour. For example, copying of manuscripts. Important works such as the scriptures and the writings of the church fathers were copied onto vellum or parchment 
using pens and ink or colored pigments. The books were then bound as we see them today. Probably the most famous example of these masterpieces is the Book of Kells, which is kept on display in Trinity College in Dublin. So how do the monks have their meals? The first and the principal meal of the day was taken at three o'clock in the afternoon. It was a frugal affair and consisted mainly of bread and vegetables. Some monasteries allowed meat, beer and wine. The Irish monks were known for their asceticism. Wednesdays and Fridays were normally kept as fast days. Three lengths were observed, namely 40 days before Christmas, the second one the regular Lent before Easter, and the third one 40 days after Whitsuntide. Whitsunday was the name given to Pentecost Sunday. On other aspects of mortification embraced by the monks, Father Harney writes, Great stress was laid on the conquest of the spirit. St. Columbanus wrote a long chapter on mortification, insisting on the internal mortification of the will through obedience. He strongly desired that his monks be guided by prudent elders, lest they fall into errors and extravaganzas. This was a specially wise course for all sorts of bodily penances, ascetical practices, curtailment of sleep, long silences and literal acceptance of obedience were assiduously embraced by the Irish monks. Indeed, because of its assistance, because of its insistence on great austerities, the Gaelic monasticism on the continent had to yield to the relatively milder rule of Saint Benedict. An old Irish homily outlined three types of martyrdom. Namely, number one, a white martyrdom, by which the monk curbed his body by external austerities. Number two, a blue martyrdom, by which the monk restrained his will by internal self-denial. And number three, a red martyrdom, by which the monk actually shed his heart's blood in testimony of Christ. The Irish monasteries were famous for their schools. Now let's have a look at the schools. Each monastery had a school attached to it. These schools were famous throughout Christendom for their learning. The rich and the powerful from far and wide, including kings and queens, sent their children to these schools to be educated. The monastic school was a simple, small structure. Instruction was often given out of doors. Father Harney tells us that the dwellings of the students were all small huts or cells and those were arranged around, around the larger cell of the Ard Olive, or in the English language the head teacher. All, whatever their social rank, were taught and treated alike and all had to share in the manual labour of keeping the school in order even of preparing the meals. Always amongst the scholars were to be found poor, friendless, but clever lads, eager to accept the free education which the monks were so happy to impart. St. Bede the Venerable speaks highly of the learning given by the Irish monks and also their charity in providing such learning free of charge. Subjects taught in these schools included Latin, Gaelic history and legends, the writings of the church fathers, the church canons and literature, and above all, sacred scripture. Indeed, so highly was scripture rated that the doctor of scripture was ranked alongside the olive. The parts of the Bible, especially the Psalms, the Gospels and the epistles of St. Paul, had to be read and memorised.
Finally, the day would come when the monk's life would draw to a close and he had to ensure he was well prepared for the next life. He prepared himself well with confession and holy viaticum which was administered by the abbot himself. The community gathered in prayer around the bedside of the dying monk. The dying monk would speak a last farewell to his brethren if he could and then he himself would intone the antiphon for the departing soul. Few tears were shed for the departed monk as the day of his death was considered his natal day in heaven. As we opened this programme with some words by Henry Daniel Rupps, it seems fitting that we conclude with some further words from the same historian. For several hundred years, through the agencies of all those religious houses founded by them, and which in turn propagated others, like so many plants, Christian Europe realised how much she owed to the Celtic monks from the islands and to their tireless action. But does she still realise it? Is she today sufficiently aware of the importance of what we have called the Irish miracle? For, to put it briefly, the real Irish miracle was indeed this second starting point of Christianity. This miracle of a land which had only just itself been baptised, showing itself at once so marvellously faithful to the evangelicist, ev evangelicistic spirit. In those dark days of the West, Ireland was like a second Palestine, a second cradle of the faith. This all too little known history provides us with a wealth of themes on which to meditate. A missioned land capable of becoming on the very morrow of conversion a nursery for missionaries. Sadly, those words which were written in the 1950s ring so poignant today, six decades later, given that so much of Europe including Ireland, has all but abandoned the faith. This episode of the History Programme was researched and presented by Frost Solanus for Gate of Heaven Radio. We hope you have enjoyed it and will join us again next month for another episode of the History Programme. Ave Maria.